Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the brain, structure and function. Remember, structure is what it's made up of, and function is what does it do. We sometimes refer to this as the anatomy or structure and the physiology or the function. And so the cool thing is that we're going to go through 17 different structures in the brain, kind of lay out uh, the basic plan of the brain, but you're using your brain to process it. And if you do a good job when we get to the end and I review all the parts, you should be able to tell me what their structure is and what their function is. And so what type of organisms have brains? It's the animals. Animals use nerves, they have muscles to move around, and so they have to organize that movement and so they use a brain. And so if we look at the two basic body plans of animals, some are radially symmetrical. In other words, they're, they're built around almost a tire. And then some are bilaterally symmetrical. In other words, a tiger, you could draw a line right down the middle. There's going to be a clear right side and a left side. There's going to be a clear front and end. And as we became bilaterally symmetrical, we had to organize that movement. And so this is a simple animal body plan. And so this animal is going to move towards the right. And as it does so, it has has to take in information. We call that sensory information using neurons. And so right now you're taking in sensory information from your eyes, from your ears, and then inside your brain you're going to integrate that information. You're going to make sense of it and then you're going to figure out what you want to do, how you're going to act uh, dependent upon that. And so then we have this loop of motor neurons out or motor nerves. And so this loop in simple animals is also important in understanding how our brain works. But if we look at these real primitive brain, they, we find that they have a real common structure. They have these four humps and we call those the, well, the first one's not a hump, but the spinal cord. We then have the hind brain, the midbrain, and then we finally have the forebrain. And we find this consistent throughout all animals. And if we look at something like a shark, it pretty much looks just like that primitive brain. You can see down here we've got the spinal cord that's bringing information in. We then have the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And so one thing you should remember is that the closer we are to that spinal cord, um, the more basic the functions are. And so we're right down in this hindbrain, it's going to be um, basically keeping the heart beating, keep the circulation going, digestion in the shark. But when a shark decides to attack you or it has some kind of an emotional response, that's going to be way up here in the forebrain. Now, if we look at you when you were really little, when you were an embryo, you had a brain that looked very similar. You had a spinal cord, you then had a hind brain, you had a midbrain, and then you had a forebrain. But during development, that, that brain changes radically. And so this is what an adult brain looks like. So we still see, see that spinal cord. We then have the hind brain, we have the midbrain, but look how large that forebrain is going to be. And so that's where all of those emotions and memories and all of that thing thinking we, we generally attribute to the brain is going to be in the forebrain. And so let's get to the actual anatomy. And so there are going to be 17 parts that we're going to go through. So you should always be thinking, what's the name of the structure? Uh, where is it? And then what's the function? What does it do? And so if we look at a basic brain plan, we find these four things jump out right away. We're going to see the brain stem. We then see a cerebellum on the back of the brain. So again, to get yourself uh, oriented right, the eyes are going to be right up here. And so this would be towards the back of the head. So that's going to be the cerebellum. We then have the area of the thalamus, hypothalamus, and then finally we have the cerebrum, which is going to be that dominant upper portion of the brain. And so let's begin with the brain stem. The brain stem is broken down into three individual structures. So if we start at the bottom, We've got the medulla oblongata, the pons, and then we finally have the midbrain. And so those three things, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain, make up what we call the brainstem. So that's the structure. What's the function? Well, it really does two things. The first thing it's going to do are these more basic needs. It's going to keep your um, self-breathing, keep circulation going, digestion, swallowing. All of that is going to be controlled by the brain stem. If there's any damage to the brain stem, it's going to be catastrophic. Um, what else does it do? Then we have information coming in. So we have sensory information, just like that worm did, coming up to the brain. And then we have motor nerves going out. And so the brain stem is important in routing that information and filtering that information, sending it where it needs to go. What's behind that? We have the cerebellum. The cerebellum and the function of that is motor control. So as you do sports, for example, it's the cerebellum that's giving you that uh, coordination. And it also gives you motor memory. So as you learn to ride a bicycle and you remember how to ride a bicycle, that's going to be thanks to your cerebellum. If we keep moving up, we now have the thalamus. The thalamus, again, sits right on top of the brainstem. And so the best analogy I could come up with is a router. It's basically sorting data and sending it where it needs 
needs to go. If we were to look below that, there's a, a little structure here that's incredibly important. It's called the hypothalamus. That's going to be really right above the roof of your mouth. What is that accountable for? It's homeostasis. So it's maintaining uh, body temperature. It's maintaining osmolarity. All of that stuff is contained uh, right up in the hypothalamus. Also important in circadian rhythms. And then if we look right below that, you can see a little gland hanging out. And one half of that pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary, is technically part of the brain. And it's important in... Um, basically sending off hormones. And so there are nerves that flow into that pituitary and it's sending out things like antidiuretic hormone that keeps your water balance the same. Uh, oxytocin would be another important hormone that comes out of there. If we keep moving up, then we get to the level of the cerebrum. What's the function of the cerebrum? That's integration. So what we're doing is making sense of all that data that comes in. Now what makes up that cerebrum are going to be all these neurons. There's tons of neurons that are connected together. Billions of neurons and billions and billions of synapses or connections between these neurons. And that's where we're making sense of information as it comes in. Now if you were to look at this image right here, so of that brick wall, so take a moment to look at that and I'm going to show you some other images. Now focus on this and then that, and then that. And what we find is as you look at those images, your brain is integrating. It's making sense of all that information. And it used to be a black box. We didn't know really what was going on, but now we can use technology like a functional MRI. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what we're looking at here is a brain in action. So this same study was done on females and what they would show them is something neutral like a brick wall and then a kitten and then something like dirt and then something like puppies. And so what we're seeing is as those images are switching back and forth, we can start to see where blood is flowing around in the brain and we can start to figure out what the different parts of the brain actually do. We're able to figure out their function. So when we're looking at the cerebrum, every picture that I've showed you is from the side, so the eyes up here. But if we were to rotate that 90 degrees, now we're looking at it head on, we'll find that there are two hemispheres. There's going to be a right and a left hemisphere. Now they're connected in the middle using something called the corpus callosum. So that's a connection of nerves in between the two hemispheres. And we do tend to show lateralization. There are going to be certain things that we put kind of on the left side of our brain, like mathematical reasoning and logic and things that we put on the right side like facial recognition. Now this is plastic. In other words, we can move these functions back and forth. And you can even have a radical um, hemispherectomy where you're cutting one of these out and you still have a functioning brain. Now if we were to go right below the corpus callosum, we get into this area called the basal ganglia and it's made up of a bunch of nuclei. What are nuclei or what is a nucleus in a brain? It's basically a bunch of neurons that are right next to each other that have the same function. And so all of these nuclei together make up what's called the basal ganglia. And you can see this would be the corpus callosum connecting it together as well. So this is below the cerebral cortex. What's the function of that? Well, scientists have been able to figure out there's this, this complex interaction of inhibition and excitatory response between these neurons, and basically it controls a lot of our motor control. And if you have somebody who has Parkinson's disease, then we're having problems in this basal ganglia area. As we move farther up the brain, we eventually get to the cerebral cortex, and that's going to make up about 80% of the brain. So it's most of the brain itself, and it's broken apart into these four lobes. And so if we start in the front of the brain, we have what's called the frontal lobe. What's the function of that? It's mostly executive function, so it's kind of like uh, the boss of your brain. It's emotional control up there. And if we have people who have damage to that frontal lobe, they have really uh, huge emotional swings. As we move back towards the back of the brain, we get to the parietal. Uh, lobe. What's the function of that? It basically is sensation. It's you uh, dealing with and reacting to your environment. So we have a lot of neurons coming in here from uh, sensory input. As we move to the back, we have the occipital lobe. Uh, the function of that is vision, primarily vision. And then we move onto the side, we have what are called the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe is going to be important in language. It's important in hearing. It's also important in memory. We have a lot of memories in there. And so each of these lobes have different uh, functions that are associated with it and hopefully those little icons help you remember those functions. Now if we were to go inside the parietal zone we'd find a really uh, important part here it's called the somatosensory cortex. 
And that's where sensory information is coming into the brain. And then on the other side of the lobe, we have what's called the motor cortex. And so going way back to that worm, we have information coming in, sensory information, and then we have motor output coming out. And so that's going to be a point of integration where we get information in, decide what we want to do with it, and then send that message back out. Now, if we were to look at that somatosensory cortex and map it along the cerebral cortex, we would find that we dedicate huge amounts of that brain surface area to things like your fingers, your tongue, your lips. In other words, we have way more neurons and way more sensory information coming in from your fingers as opposed to, for example, your back. We don't have as much of it dedicated to that on the backside. We could also use functional MRIs and then even an operation to figure out where a lot of these things are located like speech and smell and hearing. But over the future, we're going to get really, really good at figuring out specifically what are all the different parts of the brain, what are the nuclei, what do they do, and even mapping it down to the level of the neuron. So how did you do? Do you remember those 17 different structures and their functions? Well, it's time to review. So let's go through it. What's this one at the bottom? Overall, we call that the brain stem. Hopefully you got that. Um, what are the three parts of the brain stem though? Do you remember that? Could you pause the video and then say what they are? Well, starting from the bottom, remember we have the medulla oblongata, we then have the pons, and then we have the midbrain. So that's going to be the structure and where it's found. Can you remember the two functions of the brain stem? Two big things were, number one is to maintain breathing, heart rate, uh, digestion, swallowing, so these fundamental properties of life. But what's the second one? Remember, it's to sort information going up and down. Uh, what's behind that? What's that structure called? That is the cerebellum. And so what's the cerebellum do? Remember, that's coordination, motor control, and also motor memory. Do you remember what sits right up above the brain stem? That is the thalamus. What's the thalamus do? Remember, it sorts information as it moves up to the upper parts of the cerebrum. What's below that? That is the hypothalamus underneath that. What's that do? Remember, that's homeostasis. It's maintaining that internal body state. Do you remember what hangs off the bottom of that? That is the posterior pituitary. Hopefully you're doing well so far. If we keep going then, what is this upper portion of the brain called? We call that the cerebrum. Okay, let's keep going into the cerebrum then. So do you remember what's that connection between the two hemispheres of the brain? We call that the corpus callosum. And do you remember what we call those little nuclei that are found below that uh, cerebrum? Those are called the basal ganglia, and they're really important in um, motor control. And remember, the corpus callosum allows our hemispheres to connect. If we were to go up to the upper portion, what do we call this you know, highly folded upper portion of the cerebrum? That's called the cerebral cortex. Do you remember what the front lobe is called? <laughs> that was pretty easy. That's called the frontal lobe. What about the yellow lobe right here? That's called the parietal lobe. Do you remember what they do? Frontal lobe, remember, is executive or boss-like functions. And then parietal is going to be sensation of the environment. What about at the end? Do you remember that? That's called the occipital. And then what about at the bottom? That's the temporal. Occipital, remember, is a location where we have vision. And then temporal is going to be more language, hearing, memories are there. Now there are two other parts in our lobe. So what do we call this area right here and then this area right here? Those are called the somatosensory cortex. Remember that takes in information, makes sense of it. And then we have the motor cortex, which is sending information out. So those are those 17 structures. If you don't remember them, you may want to watch the video again, maybe make some flashcards, but that's the brain and I hope that was helpful.